September 29, 2002 at Kansas Speedway, and what should have easily been one of the greatest championship points battles of all time is about to go straight to hell. Mark Martin leads the points going into this race, and all he needs to do to maintain his lead is finish in the top 10. He'll later say of all of his championship runner-up finishes that this one hurt the most. The point leader has stalled there, pushing him down pit road, the car will not refire. But before we get into all that, let's take a look at what Mark's been up to in the meantime. His 1998 season was just legendary and would have easily been championship caliber in any other season. But Jeff Gordon put a stop to that. Mark bounced back though and won two events in 1999 and finished third in the standings. Not bad at all. In 2000, he only won one race and finished eighth in the points. Again, not bad. But in 2001, he hits a brick wall. No wins, only three top fives, and 12th in the standings. Okay, now something is definitely wrong. Roush Racing had a hard time with the aerodynamics of the 2001 Ford Taurus, and they were behind the eight ball all year. The only driver to score any wins for them was Jeff Burton at Charlotte and Phoenix. Adding to the pressure Marcus feeling is his new sponsor, Viagra. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and make your jokes, but they were instrumental in the team's success throughout the 2000s. Valvoline had wanted to stay with the team, but Pfizer makes a deal with Roush, which at the time was the biggest sponsorship deal in NASCAR history. Not only are they sending millions to the team, but Pfizer is going on a full-on ad blitz across every network that carries NASCAR races. Mark signs on the dotted line on the agreement that they put an emphasis on the men's health aspect of their work. Pfizer agrees and spends millions raising awareness on men's health topics that have been stigmatized before, getting regular checkups, testing for prostate and testicular cancer, and many other issues. And wouldn't you know it, death rates from those types of cancer went on the decline after that. Laugh all you want, Mark Martin and Viagra saved lives, folks. I'll defend that one to the grave. But during this time, it was really hard being a Mark Martin fan. No pun intended, again, take your jokes elsewhere. But you'd tell somebody that Mark was your favorite race car driver and people would inevitably go, oh yeah, that's the Viagra guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the guy. Even buying Mark Martin merch was pretty difficult, especially as a kid in middle school at this time. A lot of photos of the car and Mark in his fire suit were obviously poorly censored with Photoshop. And add that to his waning performance out on the track, and these were some seriously dark days for his fans. But even with all that extra income from the Viagra deal, Roush flounders all year. Thankfully, they have a multi-year contract in place and have time to fix the problems that ail them. Mark, though, is starting to have some serious doubts creep up into his mind for the first time since the early 80s. Is he washed up? Is this it? Is he ever going to win another race? It seems silly to think now that he was considering himself a has-been in the early 2000s, knowing what we know today, but it's a legit concern in 2001. He's in his 40s now, and he knows he's running out of time as a driver. He has, at most, another 10 years ahead of him. He goes into the 2002 season, unsure of himself and his future. But Jack Roush has a plan in place to deal with the malaise of his teams. Kurt Busch was a young, fast, and brash driver, and Jack had originally given him a team of young, brash people to work with, thinking that like minds would come together and accomplish great things. But the team is all over the place and needs guidance. Mark Martin's team, however, is full of older, more established members that have been working with the organization for over a decade. Jimmy Finnick, who had orchestrated Mark's 1998 dominance, is sent to stabilize Kurt Busch, and Busch's crew chief is sent over to Mark. His name is Ben Leslie. As unpredictable as he was genius, in 2002, Ben will give Mark one of the most consistent seasons of his entire career, but in 2003, he'll give him one of his most inconsistent. The young man has other young crew members joining him in the migration, and Mark's knowledge of setup seeps into the team and they start running like they should again. The arrow of the cars is figured out, and a reinvigorated Mark Martin sets out into 2002 with high hopes. He finishes sixth in the Daytona 500, and has some finishes all over the place in the early stages of the season. But in May, he strikes gold. Fending off his hard-charging teammate, Matt Kenseth, Mark wins his first Coca-Cola 600 and won a million dollars in the No Bull 5 event. Back in the Winston Cup days for five Crown Jewel events throughout the year, the top five in the points would be eligible for a million dollar payout if they could win that race. And NASCAR put orange highlights on the car so fans could easily identify them. Mark had come close to the prize before, but this was the first time he pulled it off. And before the race, he promised his team that if they won, he'd share half of the winnings with them hoping that they'd put in a little extra effort. It worked, and in victory lane, Mark said that was the hardest he had ever driven a race car and won. After this race, he sits third in the points, a good 143 points short of the points leader, who had been on top of the pile since week two. And that gets us into one of the best and most forgotten points battles in NASCAR history. So let's talk about the man that many say should have walked away with the cup at season's end, a guy from Tennessee with a really fun to say name.
If I had told you back in the 90s that Sterling Marlin would be poised to win a championship in the early 2000s and would lead the vanguard for Dodge's return to NASCAR, you would have told me I was out of my skull insane. For most of his career, Marlin looked like just another journeyman driver, like his old man Cuckoo Marlin. Man, this family just has a lot of great names. But in 1994, a deal with Morgan McClure Motorsports sees him win his first race of his career at the Daytona 500. And then he followed it up by winning the race again in 1995, becoming one of only three drivers to date who have ever won back-to-back -back 500s. He went on to win at Darlington and Talladega that year as well. But by 1997, it's become apparent to him that Morgan McClure have put all of their eggs in the super speedway basket, and they're struggling everywhere else. He nabs only two top fives that year and jumps ship to Sabco in 1998 but doesn't fare much better. Going into 2001, he hasn't done much with the team, but an IndyCar big shot named Chip Ganassi is about to partner up with Felix Sabatis of Sabco and create a real powerhouse team with Dodge support. Marlin immediately goes on a tear, winning two races and finishing third in the points. In 2002, he's looking even better and likely would have won the Daytona 500 a third time had he not done this under the red flag. The car, Sterling Marlin is jumping out of his car. He's going around to look at the right front fender, but oh, he can't do that. Hey, people call this a boneheaded move, but what else was he supposed to do? Run around with a tire rub for a few laps and cause an accident? Hell, I say take the chance, see what happens. Even after taking a penalty for that and restarting at the back of the field, he still battles back and finishes eighth. He spins and wins at Las Vegas, and then wins at Darlington, and he leads the points from round two all the way until week 27. A late season collapse is looking more and more likely, but as week 29 of 36 rolls around, he's going to a lot of tracks that favor him heavily. He won the Fall Charlotte race last year, and their Super Speedway package is fantastic, and Talladega is just next week. If they avoid DNFs and win those two races, they'll have themselves a cup at the end of the year. But Marlin's got some serious competition to deal with. After week 28 at Dover, Mark holds a narrow lead over the rookie sensation named Jimmy Johnson. No rookie has ever won the championship or even led the standings up to this point in NASCAR history, and the California kid looks to pull off the upset of the century. Speaking of upsets, sitting at third in the points is a Hoosier and former open wheeler named Tony Stewart, and the outsider is looking to nab a title in just his fourth full-time season. He is 74 points back of Mark and a mere seven ahead of Marlin. This is going to be an intense final stretch of races, but on week 29 at Kansas, what should have been the greatest title fight since 1992 goes straight to hell. On lap 147, Marlin takes a vicious crash into the turn two wall and breaks a vertebra in his neck. The man who had led the points for 26 weeks and had a rebound just in his sights is out for the remainder of the year. He's walking around and talking immediately after the wreck, but doctors will not clear him to race in the weeks ahead. The crash would effectively end his winning days. He never won another race and only netted four top fives before he retired at the end of the 2009 season. In this line of work, fate is a cruel mistress, and the racing gods care not what you think you deserve. Mark Martin has been hanging around in the top 20 all day. He's led one lap on a pit cycle move to get another five bonus points, but late in the race, he makes his move to the front. Turns out he was just hanging out mid-pack playing it safe and now it's time to pounce. He's pleaded with Jack Roush all week. Just give me a motor that can go the whole race. I don't need any extra horsepower. I just need to finish. He's inside the top 10, right where he needs to be. But with just 17 laps to go, Mark drops a cylinder and can't even get the car out of the pit box without his crew pushing it. He eventually parks the car and calls it a day. He finishes 25th. Jimmy Johnson takes the points lead and still to this day is the only rookie to ever lead the points, but he wouldn't sit atop the standings for long. Tony Stewart finishes second at Talladega the very next week. And in that race, Mark Martin and Jimmy Johnson collide together on the pace laps when Mark's steering column locks up in a freak accident. Mark finishes 30th, and Jimmy, as well as every other Hendrick-affiliated team, blows a motor. With first and second out of the way, Tony Stewart takes the points lead and cruises to his first of three championship titles. After battling back from finishing dead last in the Daytona 500 and a litany of controversies with the media, Mark Martin and Ben Leslie, in their desperation, even got docked another 25 points at Rockingham for an unimproved coil spring. But they still get the runner-up spot and gather themselves back up and press forward into 2003. They go winless and finish the year out 17th in points. By the end of that year, Ben Leslie is ousted and Pat Trison takes over crew chiefing duties and gives Mark a win apiece in 2004 and 2005, and fourth in the points both the years. In 2005, Mark announces that this will be his final full-time season, and he wants to go part-time in 2006. But Jack Roush needs one year to find a replacement driver, so he and Mark agree to a one-season deal in 2006, and Mark makes it to the chase for the third year in a row. He's in the hunt all the way up until Charlotte when a rookie J.J. Yaley pulls a Quinn Half and decides to pit from the middle lane. The crash is a scary looking one, but Mark walks away and in his post-race interview, he just seems absolutely irate. But more than that, it just seems like he's given up hope. Uh, championship, 
It's not really something that was meant to be for, for me ever. Uh, that one sentence hurt me more than any one of his championship runner-ups. It was like he was resigned to his fate at this point. And if he had given up hope, then I had to as well. Mark finished the year ninth in the standings, and I waited to hear what his plans were for 2007. It came out in the off-season that he had signed with MB2 Motorsports to take over Joe Numachek's ride in the 01 Army Chevy. I was perplexed as to what he saw in the team, but in the Daytona 500 that year, he showed everyone that team was exactly what he wanted it to be. He took the lead late and drove the race of his life, and coming out of the final corner of the final lap, I fully expected NASCAR to throw the caution as they had in every other instance up to that point in last lap super speedway pileups. They never did. Here they come, checkered flag! This is not happenstance. This is malicious torment. This is the racing gods telling you no. This is not meant for you. Not now, not ever. You must make peace with that or let it eat at you forever. Maybe we should have seen it coming. Maybe it should have been obvious now looking back at it that a guy who thought number one was too brash and cocky and purposefully chose number two finds himself in second so frustratingly often. At the beginning of the year, South Carolina real estate mogul Bobby Ginn bought out MB2 Motorsports. And by August 2007, everybody's on to the fact that he's a complete huckster who's out of money. So, Ginn Motorsports merges with the fledgling DEI team, and Mark never gets close to victory lane for the rest of the year. In 2008, he had fast cars, but just couldn't put it all together. One race at Phoenix looks like he has it in the bag after Mark goes half-throttle for the entire final pit cycle, and assures his crew chief, Tony Gibson, that he can make it on fuel and snooker a win away from the field. However, Tony is under strict orders to get the car into the top 10 in owner points, and plays it safe. Mark had lost the same race in 2006 by coming up short on fuel, and he's learned from his mistakes and begs to be left out on the track. But eventually, he begrudgingly pits for gas and finishes fifth. Mark's contract is up at the end of the year, and in 2009, I fully expect Mark to call it quits. He's got nothing left to prove. 35 wins, many more in the Xfinity series, a handful of wins in the Truck series, one ARCA win, four ASA titles, and even five championships in the International Race of Champions, the most of any driver in its 30 years of competition. But one day, after a rough day at work, I come home and see my dad in the kitchen. It was rare for him to beat me home from his job, and he just pops his head from behind the wall and asks, did you hear the news? I had been at work all day, so I answer, no, what? My dad just smirks and says, Mark Martin's going to be driving full time next year for Hendrick. I remember I stopped taking off my boots and I just looked at my dad like what he had just said to me was some kind of sick joke. But he assures me that it isn't. I go to my room, fire up the laptop, and sure enough, my dad wasn't lying to me. My favorite driver was going to drive the flagship car of the best team in motorsports full time next year. We started this series off by saying how first chances in this line of work are rare, and second chances are even rarer still. But Mark Martin, ever a defier of the odds, is about to get a third chance. He says his only objective going forward is just to win one more race, but he's about to do so much more than that. Other than a win, he just wants to go out and have as much fun as possible. You know, we've tried playing the points game, we've tried late season rebounds, we've gone for broke, we've even gone into a late season point slugfest, and we even set a litany of new records. But what if, what if we didn't try? Up next, fifth time's a charm, right? <laughs>